Um, that was a vague title on purpose because I didn't know which bits I was going to try out on you. Uh, this is a book that Yale University Press will publish um, next year. It's actually coming to a conclusion. Books are forever. Um, and uh, I'm going to mainly talk from one chapter about the Haymarket Affair in 1886, which some of you, how many of you have heard of the Haymarket Affair? Oh, OK. Well, you're going to find out mighty quick. Now, I have a, in a way, my, the, the thesis of my book is quite simple. Um, the usual definition of terrorism is that it's a political violence or the threat of it done by individuals or non-state groups to a state or a society. But it seems clear to me that in fact, what happens in those kinds of situations is the state sometimes initiates the political violence itself. Sometimes political violence is used to take over states. And sometimes, and that's really the thesis of my book, states in response to terrorism use terrorism. OK? It's a dialectic. It's an interchange. It's an exchange. So how do we look at 9-11, which inspired this book in its way? Is 9-11 merely what happened that horrible day to the World Trade Center and those 3,000 people? Or does it include the response of the Bush administration, including a concentration camp in uh, Guantanamo Bay, where people are arrested without rights, with no trial, no lawyer, no speedy hearing? They've been there five years now, six years, some of them. No civil rights whatsoever, where the American government goes after people around the world, kills some, imprisons others, somewhere in Eastern Europe. If you want a very good recent book, Jane Meyer's book, uh, The Dark Side, will tell you a lot about this. She writes for The New Yorker. I think the way to look at terrorism is like call and response. It's this and it's the response in return. Okay? Now that's very radical. Uh, don't ask me why that's so radical, but the people in terrorism studies who read the manuscript for Yale University Press said, you can't do that. And a lot of them are social scientists where I'm an historian, so I'm trained to look at narrative. I'm trained to look at interactions and changing over time. And I'm also discuss basic values, in the case of the United States, Christianity and liberties, the right, civil rights, that sort of thing as the basis of the republic over which people fight. And you'll see these themes in the chapter that I'm condensing and reading bits of to you today. So I won't ex explicate it very much more. Just let me give you a quick definition by a woman named um, um, Martha Crenshaw, who's a political scientist. She says, uh, defining terrorism becomes particularly troublesome when it occurs against the background of extensive violence. Now listen to the way she writes. Okay, it's, it's kind of confusing. But we cannot assume that it is discontinuous with political violence. Even the best scholarly intentions may not suffice to distinguish terrorism from protest, guerrilla warfare, urban guerrilla warfare, subversion, criminal violence, paramilitarism, communal violence or banditry, or terrorism in particular from political violence. Oh, that's hard to make a good, clear theory, according to her. And the answer that I have in my text is exactly. You can't make those distinctions. In fact, terrorism lapses into war crime. Uh, terrorism by the state is met by terrorism. Uh, uh, terrorism from outside is met by terrorism from the state. And uh, I do both war and I do other forms of terrorism. Uh, and so this a chapter and, and two others out of the five, these are big chapters, deal with the, the collision of revolutionary terrorism and reactionary terrorism. And these are collisions that take place first in the street and then in the courtroom, in this case, or a Senate hearing room, in other cases. There are shared symbols of patriotism, there are shared symbols of religion, over which the re revolutionary and the reactionary terrorists fight. And of course, we know who's got the most guns and the most force to come to bear when it comes to uh, getting things settled, when it comes to domination. OK? So today, uh, it's twisting the flag, anti-revolutionary uh, uh, and reactionary terrorism uh, at the Haymarket. 
Well, it was an afternoon quite like this afternoon, rainy, gloomy, late afternoon. This was in uh, May 4th, 1886, so it was a spring rain rather than a fall rain, at the Haymarket Square in Chicago. Samuel Fielden, a stone hauler and anarchist labor agitator, jumped down off the wagon from which he had been speaking. The, the dispirited crowd of ragged, mainly unemployed working men of around 600 to 1,000 began to disperse just as the phalanx of 176 policemen marched at double quick time into the square. A few minutes earlier, Fielden had called out to his audience in his working class English accent, which I won't try to replicate, you have nothing more to do with the law except to lay hands on it and throttle it until it makes its last kick. It has turned your brethren out on the wayside and degraded them until they've lost the last vestige of humanity and become mere things and animals. Keep your eye on the law, throttle it, kill it, stab it. Now the forces of the law formed ranks, military style. They were led by Inspector John Bonfield, a veteran of many savage attacks on laboring men who had instructed his men, don't spare the powder, who commanded the crowd to disperse, which they were already doing. But we are peaceable, Fielden insisted. All right, we'll go. At just that moment, a hissing spherical object sailed over the heads of the crowd into the ranks of the police and exploded with an enormous roar. As several policemen fell, wounded by the shrapnel of a dynamite bomb, <coughs> the rest pulled out their pistols and fired wildly, hitting several of their fellow policemen, as well as many in the crowd, some of whom may have had pistols and returned fire. Fire and kill all you can, uh, Police Lieutenant James Bowler shouted to his men. Seven policemen were fatally wounded, as well as a never counted but similar number of the masses of workers, men who remained faceless and nameless in the press over the days that followed, in death as in life. Well, there was a huge outburst of public opinion, just, at, just like after 9-11, all law and order. Julius Grinnell, the, the, the state's attorney for um, uh, Cook County, which is where Chicago is located, said, make the raids first, look up the law afterward. And the police swept in <coughs> to labor halls, private residences, broke up picket lines, arrested over 200 workers, some say 400, threw them in jail without charges <coughs> or the right to secure an attorney and beat the hell out of a number of them. And uh, asking, uh, compelling, uh, prisoners to turn state's evidence, which several did, making up evidence whole cloth, as it turns out. Okay, then uh, on May 27, three weeks after the bomb, eight of the prisoners, who were the anarchist leaders, were indicted for murder and criminal conspiracy. They were brought to trial on June 27th, <coughs> convicted on August 20th, and all but one sentenced to hang, and four of them would eventually be hanged on November 11th of the next year. One um, blew his brains out in his cell the night before he was to be hanged. The drama of this trial and its aftermath revealed the, ray, the depths of anger that lay at the core of American industrial and social relations and the fears aroused among the better off uh, in the new industrial cities that were filling with frightening alien uh, workers toiling in satanic mills. In the haze of the Haymarket bomb, the Red Scare and Show trial that followed amounted to legally sanctioned uh, reactionary terrorism, uh, responding to the revolutionary anarchist terrorism uh, of the streets, both sides of which I'll depict. The Golden Rule was reconstituted to read, do unto others as you fear they will do unto you. So that contested value structure and that trial is my main topic. Now, <coughs> the first major uh, outburst of labor unrest had been in 1877. There was a national railroad strike that was kind of a wildcat strike that took off. And um, it was repressed by actually the calling out of the federal, of federal troops. The first time federal troops were used for uh, labor uh, relations to, to put down a, a, a strike. The um, people in the various states were afraid the militias would go over to the other side. Um, and. Uh, uh, actually, that's the same year that the uh, troops are withdrawn from the American South 
and would no longer defend black people's rights uh, at the end of Reconstruction. Uh, and also, the great world event that people kept referring to uh, was the Commune in 1871 in Paris, uh, when 25,000 workers are killed uh, in about a week, I think, uh, who had seized Paris at the end of the Franco-Prussian uh, War. Uh, the, French, the new French Republic regathered. The, the German troops surrounding the city stood aside and let the um, uh, French troops go in and slaughter their countrymen. Uh, who were communists of, of, of a certain variety. And that was very much on the minds of people in authority uh, all around the world. Now, the basic foundational text of these uh, anarchists was written by a German immigrant, actually an international revolutionary named Johann Most. Uh, uh, he wrote the 1883 platform of the International Working Men's Association. Uh, he insisted that the necessities of the present time could, to compel us to reassert the Declaration of, Evi of, Re of, of, the Declaration of Independence. And the Declaration of Independence uh, obviously made um, the right to bear arms central. Uh, Jeff so he apes, he uses the language of Jefferson, most does, makes a list of current social evils the same way Jefferson had in his document, including the, pro the exploitation of the property propertyless by the property. Now I have two cups of water. Thank you, very, that's great, I appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> who enriched themselves off labor while they did no productive work and tended toward greater and greater monopoly of wealth and power while workers were driven into ever deeper poverty. All current laws, most argue, were directed against workers. Schools for the poor gave little but crude indoctrination producing prejudice, arrogance, and servility, in short, a want of sense. While churches sought to make complete idiots out of the masses and to make them forego, forego the paradise on earth by promising a fictitious heaven. The press and the political parties were mere lackeys directed by the capitalist classes who never would cede power voluntarily. Well, now that's standard fair socialist analysis uh, in, in that period and later. It's the remedy and the social goal that set anarchists apart. In fact, they called themselves revolutionary socialists. To strike off their chains, most wrote, workers must create agitation for the purposes of agitation, organization for the purpose of rebellion. Knowing that no good can be expected from our master, there remains but one resource, force. Only total destruction of the ruling class would lead to a free society based on cooperative organization to exchange of products without merchant capitalism, without profit mongery. No God, no master, their banners proclaimed when the international workers marched on public holidays. No priests, no capitalists, no state, no law. Religion was another building block that needed utter demolition. And here let me introduce Albert Parsons, who was, uh, unlike most of the leadership, was actually um, of American stock, old American stock. He, in fact, had been in the Confederate Army in Texas. He's an amazing character. About, about maybe 20% of the anarchists in Chicago were uh, working class um, Anglo-Saxon, and the other 80% or so were Eastern European and German primarily. Anyway, as Albert Parsons put it in 1885, anarchy and religion were locked in a struggle for supremacy between the real and the unreal, between the known and the unknown, between the natural and the unnatural, between knowledge and superstition. Anarchy was armed with ideas only, while all the material forces, the brute force of the established order, was arrayed on the side of religion. See, he's going after all the building blocks of the order, and, and, and not just the state, it's the whole, it's the whole package. Whether consciously or not, uh, what Parsons did frequently in his public speeches, which are totally riveting, he reversed the Christian message. And he assumed the voice and logic of an evangelical preacher. He was bred in the Protestant religious system he now scorned. He certainly understood how Christians would see him as the Antichrist. And he would give these speeches, you've heard of the Jeremiah, when you give people hell for not behaving right and God's going to get even with you. Well, he did counter Jeremiah's. He threatened people with imminent damnation if they did not mend their ways. 
And in fact, he used the Bible quite a lot. He loved quoting from the Bible when attacking religion. Uh, on Thanksgiving Day, I'll give you a flavor of this. Uh, in 1884, he spoke to a crowd of 3,000 in the uh, Haymarket. Rich capitalists, he said, were enjoying today the feast of Balthazar, wrung from the blood of our wives and children, and the champagne thus obtained ought to strangle them. Fancy preachers and elegant churches were that day quoting scriptures of reassurance to the capitalists. So he quoted in response those portions of the Holy Book that amounted to a sort of anarchist alternative version of scripture. Nice thing about the, the Bible is there's everything in it. His favorite verse was from St. James. Go now, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries which shall come upon you. Your gold and silver are cankered and shall eat your flesh as if it were fire. Behold the hire of the laborers which have reaped down your fields and which you have kept back by fraud, who crieth, Woe to them, and bring about iniquity by law. Did you think of St. James as a revolutionary figure? Well, he did say those things. There. That's part of the Old Testament. It's not the part that evangelical Christians quote to us today, but it's there. He also quoted Solomon, Amos, Isaiah, and Habakkuk. Habakkuk had warned the Israelites, Woe to him that buildeth a town by blood and establish a city by iniquity. He concluded that unlike the poor among the Hebrews and Christians of old, we do not intend to leave this matter in the hands of the Lord. We intend to do something for ourselves and to do it in this world. Okay, he knew the religion he rejected. And after all, the Judeo-Christian God was said to love the downtrodden. But more than that, his consciousness and most of the workers listening to, them had been to him had been formed in Christian churches. They extended their anti-authoritarianism to the strictures of churchly leadership, discipline, and creed. They knew the God and the religious values they hated that could still be turned to religious purposes if they were reworked for alternative apocalyptic ends. But they were still apocalyptic ends. Uh, anarchist agitators preached a scientific faith grounded in a zealous uh, religious values and republicanism, as most did, uh, the very values that they sought to overturn. You know what the apocalypse is. It's all going to end in a bang, not a whimper. And what you do is you discern the signs of end times. Well, that's all over the Bible. Uh, and it's also all over the revolution, capital Q, capital R. The revolution is, this, is a kind of secular version of the apocalypse. It's really the same thing, that same notion of a great explosion. And you don't know when it's coming, but you better be prepared. And it could come at any time. Also, if you're an active type, you might want to help it along a little bit. <clears throat> Disintegration would precede revolution. The poorest of the poor, utterly exploited and alienated, were in the best position to shed all vestiges of past submission and claims to respectability and forged in anarchist consciousness arise up and strike down the state. Now here's uh, from the, um, there was a, a German language anarchist daily paper in Chicago called the Eiberter Zeitung, which was a, had 40,000, it printed 40,000. It was also a bit of a national journal. Here's um, a, um, an editorial called The New Anarchist Man. Okay, when uh, order and justice are maintained by traditional leaders, they're just harlequins given to treason, lying and blood, devastation and destruction marking their course. Life appears impossible for the poor working wretches. These, but however, uh, these men, these workers in the shadows have serious faces which express courage, fearlessness, character and the power of action. They carry weapons and cannot have good intentions. It is night so that their forms and movements can scarcely be seen. Are they criminals? But no. Their faces reflect a higher radiance that surrounds their ideal features, frank, fiery eyes, proud self-possession. When they come into focus from the midst of the background, one sees emblazoned on their red flag and their black flag, death to the tyrant, death to deception and lies. Soon their ranks will grow numberless. The avengers of the exploited generations will arise. You must be as wolves, and you need sharp teeth. Working men, arm yourselves. Okay, it's a very romantic revolutionary picture, isn't it? And this, this new man is clearly going to be more powerful 
than the, the forces he opposes. Now, unlike other unions or socialist movements uh, the anarch with whom the anarchists were competing for membership, they also overlapped. And some, I would say most of the anarchists, believed in going into the unions uh, and being involved with other uh, socialists. However, the socialists had faith in the political process. They could build a working man's party that way. The anarchists had none. And beyond that, there were among the anarchists, the most anarchists of the anarchists, the altruists, were called automatists. They rejected the tendency to bureaucratic or organization, not merely in, in the institutions of the state, even in anarchist institutions. They believed you should work outside of all institutions in order to bring about anarchists' ends. This amounts to nihilism, the total and absolute destructiveness of authority and if necessary, taking yourself with it. The uh, nihilist uh, assassination of Tsar Nicholas I in Russia in 1881 was to them a thrilling example of what could happen. Uh, so they believed that, as one editorial said it, no government can exist without a head, and we'll take uh, heads away one by one. We'll have repeated assassinations and destroy government, and all governments will disappear forever uh, because eventually you'll knock them all off. Not only that, nihilists argued in a kind of Nietzschean fashion that assassination, this is the language of one, assassination properly applied is wise, humane, and brave. For freedom, all things are just. If you are to be destroyed, destroy your would-be destroyer, or at least take him with you. This was the freedom fighter of the last resort. <clears throat> As you might guess, the means to ignite this process uh, had, was a recent Swedish invention, dynamite. And these folks made a, a fetish of dynamite. More than any other topic in their magazines, using dynamite filled their imagination. It would seem so perfect, all that concentrated destructive power, cheaply made, easily concealed, deadly, deadly. Dynamite seemed to level the playing field of political violence. Properly used, it made one little man as strong as whole regiments. It was what terrorist studies people call asymmetrical warfare. And given a slight variation on the kind of dynamite used, that's what the suicide bombers strap around their belts, right? It's cheap, uh, you can make it easily, you can take a lot of people out with you. And it it's continues to be used. In many ways, dynamite was taken up by anarchists as soon as it was available. Dynamite, uh, one uh, journal, the alarm saying out, dynamite is the emancipator. In the hands of the enslaved, it cries out justice or annihilation. Dynamite will destroy private property and government, will liquidate all vestiges of submission. In the following year, an independent, Indianapolis anarchist almost swooned. Dynamite, of all the good stuff, this is the sublime stuff. And there were even poems written to the beauties of dynamite. Dynamite shall free the slave, all ye men who fear not, forward. Though you fill a martyr's grave, yet the tyrant private property dethrone the coming race. Bright with glowing fire of freedom, shall thy name in honor trace. Okay, so it wasn't just that. It was also Winchester rifles. Uh, it was pistols. It was whatever was available. But dynamite seemed to be the most uh, powerful uh, weapon envisioned. Well, in the spring of 1886, the Chicago police were running especially scared. They heard all this stuff. They took notes. I got all this out of police records. So they, they had people, obviously they had agent provocateur, and they had people taking down all the speeches. And at, at, this was at the bottom of a terrible depression, 1886. Uh, there was an eight-hour movement in the union movement, uh, which was a kind of umbrella organization, and some of the anarchists joined. And in fact, in April 1886, about 25,000 workers gathered one evening at a lakefront rally uh, called by the uh, Central Labor Union, and the most effective speakers there were anarchists. On May 1st, the traditional Workers' Day, 300,000 men went on strike nationally, 40,000 in Chicago alone, and 80,000 workers, led by Albert Parsons, marched up Michigan Avenue in the heart of the city's elegant shopping district. Such numbers were unprecedented. Suddenly, the anarchist message appeared to be triggering an enormous mass response. Is this 
end times. Then on May 3rd, as the anarchists conducted a rally near the McCormick Reaper plant, and that was the first big industry, was farm machinery uh, in Chicago. Uh, some strikers in the crowd broke off to taunt the scabs who had taken their jobs. The police intervened, firing on the crowd, killing at least two workers, although some numbers say six, some say 12, wounded 25 more and scattered the rest. Uh, this is just uh, four days after uh, 80,000 masked marchers on May Day, and so the, Al the Arbeiter Zeitung dashed off a furious broadside that was widely distributed around Chicago that night. You notice it's in two languages. Revenge, working into arms. The last lines of the English version are, if you are men, you'll rise in your heights, Hercules, and destroy the hideous monster that seeks to destroy you. To arms we call you, to arms. The German part on the bottom was even hotter. Slaves, we ask and conjure you by all that is sacred and dear to you. Avenge the atrocious murder that have been committed upon your brothers today and which will likely be committed on you tomorrow. Annihilate the beasts in human form who call themselves rulers, uncompromising annihilation to them. By the next uh, morning, the anarchists had decided to call a mass meeting at the Haymarket. And this is the uh, poster that was plastered all around town at 7.30 that morning. Attention, working men, mass meeting. Working men, arm yourselves and appear in full force. So about 1,500 workers came to the square. About 600 were left by the time uh, the bomb exploded. OK, that's the revolutionary terrorist ideology in a nutshell. Now I'll do the reactionary terrorist ideology that responded. As you've seen, the police themselves had already, um, had already been aware of this stuff, had already been involved in strikes, and had become increasingly violent and became increasingly frightened. Well, after the indictments of these uh, eight labor leaders, um, the jury was packed. Rather than choosing names at random from a box, which is the usual practice in criminal cases, the state's attorney, Julius Grinnell, appointed somebody called Rice, a special bailiff. He went down to the Board of Trade and collected names of clerks, merchants, and manufacturers who are the middle class men most likely to detest anarchists. And in fact, <coughs> a year later, uh, one, uh, after the men, right before the men were to be hanged, a Chicago businessman named Otis Favor, who's an old friend of the bailiffs, made a deposition that Rice had said to him back then when he was gathering jurors, I'm managing this case and I know what I'm about. Those fellows are gonna be hanged as certain as death. I'm calling such men as the defendants will have to challenge preemptorily and waste their time in challenges. Then they'll have to take such men as the prosecution wants. And in the end, five salesmen, five clerks, a hardware dealer, and a school principal composed the jury trying radical workers. So it's the middle class trying the working class. And then the judge uh, would question potential jurors, and the, uh, he would overrule the defense attorney who would try to get them um, dismissed for prejudice. I'll give you one example. Here's James Walker, a dry goods merchant. He admitted to the defense attorney that he had formed an opinion on the guilt of the defendants, and he told other people about it, and that he was prejudiced. So Black asked him, assuming your present opinion that you believe the defendants guilty, would you believe your present opinion would warrant your convicting them? I presume it would, he said. Then the judge took over the questioning. He said, over and over again in different forms. Do you believe you can sit here and fairly and impartially make up your mind from the evidence whether the evidence proves that they're guilty beyond a reasonable doubt? Well, Walker said, I think I could, but I believe I'd be a little handicapped in my judgment. Whereupon Judge Gary said in the presence of the whole pool of jurors, or potential jurors who hadn't been examined, well, that's a sufficient qualification for a juror in the case of course, the more a man feels he's handicapped, the more he'll guard against it. Now, I've never known whether the judge was cynical or ironic or just stupid, 
But it was pretty clear who he wanted to sit in the jury. And these cases are repeated time after time. It's, quite a, it's almost funny to read this stuff. Okay, now let me give you some flavor of the language used by people who are supporting the law and order side. Here's, um, um, uh, he was a lawyer named Charles Carroll Bonney who gave a long talk. Um, it is the nature of the, of the law to retaliate. It is the gospel, not the law, that returns good for evil. Law, well and fearlessly enforced, alone should subdue the anarchists. They would not strike the law if they believed it certain the law would at once strike back. Um, but in fact, it depends on which version of the gospel you preach uh, as to what, what, what the position of the church would be about the Haymarket. Here's uh, Reverend Frederick A. Noble um, preaching five days after the Haymarket bombing. He was from actually a rather uh, upper class uh, congregation, the New Jerusalem Congregational Church. He took, as his text, he could find the text in the Bible too. He took Isaiah uh, 59 as his text. Their feet shall run to evil and they make haste to sh uh, shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity, desolation and destruction are in their paths. The way of peace they know not. So what Noble did was read the anarchists out of the human race. He condemned them as fiends fresh from European jails, as unparalleled in modern times for their cool, calculating, satanic maliciousness. They weren't trying to make a revolution, but to unleash the disastrous fury of a cyclone to ruin government, law, and property, home and church, school and business, all the institutions and underlying values of civilization. These miscreants who proclaim no God, no law, no master must be made to feel the crushing weight of the authority they've outraged and defiled. Then he went into a rap like Albert Parsons, uh, except on the other side, he, he preached uh, blood revenge. They have rolled their garments in blood. Let them suffer the legitimate consequences of their doing. Let them drain the dregs of the cup of their own spilling. They have said with fiendish deliberation that blood must be spilled, Blood has been spilled. Let their own veins and arteries furnish the further supply. They have said that heads must fall. Heads have fallen. Let these men now have the privilege of, furnish, of furnishing a few heads for the basket. I know of no cause more in need of martyrs. Let them have a few as speedily as possible. It's kind of weird. He uses the French Revolution, the heads in the basket after the guillotine, as his imagery connecting it to the Bible. Uh, he's gonna, it's, it's all about vengeance, which he said is standard. He also said it's standard American practice. The Civil War, which wasn't that long past, 25 years past, had been a rebirth of the United States in political violence. The old flag has been bathed in blood over and over again that it might mean liberty. Americans should never quail in fear of using righteous and cleansing political violence. <clears throat> For as long as it takes, bloody rioters will have to be smitten down in the streets, harangers of sedition ruthlessly silenced, and murderers and a better of murderers hung. Okay, that's a kind of post-9-11 sound, isn't it? And the newspapers were filled with this sort of thing as well. Uh, almost every rhetorical rendering of the anarchists, uh, before, during, and after the trial, Repeated images of the subhuman beast, the un-American, the unchristian, the devil. And many cartoonists did the same thing. The most famous was Thomas Nast, himself a German immigrant, who had been actually a very progressive force, but by this point in his life was turning very anti-immigrant, very anti-Roman Catholic. I don't know if some of you have seen the cartoon of, of Catholic uh, cardinals coming out of the water like this, and the mitre hat is like alligators. Um, so he's kind of turned that direction anyway. And he uh, drew for the Harper's Weekly. He was the biggest cartoonist of his time. Um, now this is an image he drew um, 10 weeks before the Haymarket. Okay. That might have been Johann Most that he's um, uh, doing. Um, look, the hair of the anarchist leader, it's twisted on top into two horns. He's trailing the bloody red flag, that's what it says on it, between his legs like a tail. 
Nast urges the police to crack the anarchist skull with American righteousness or perhaps to shoot the agitator, to act more boldly than the uh, ineffective London police had done in a recent riot when a mob of unemployed workers had trashed several uh, gentlemen's clubs on Pall Mall. So there he is, the stereotype, the godless, un-American anarchist devil, even prior to the Haymarket. This is the very same uh, figure, the same devil anarchist. This is on June 5th, 1886, a month after Haymarket. Now he waves a black flag and a pistol in his other hand. He's got a bomb between his feet. Uh, his heavy boots are desecrating the stars and stripes. Nast offers him the alternative of hanging at the hands of Uncle Sam on his left or returning to Germany on the next steamer. Miss Liberty's pointing to a ship that says Bremen telling the anarchist to go if you don't like the institutions of our republic or commit murder and you will be punished with death. So is America, love it or leave it. And if you act out um, your negative thoughts, you will be destroyed. Now Miss Liberty, the spirit of the American Republic, was very much in people's minds as the Statue of Liberty, a gift from the French Republic, currently was being uh, constructed in New York Harbor. It was dedicated on October 28th, 1886. This is a different cartoonist named Cassidy. I think, yeah. This is Miss Liberty, and she's, um, she stands on a pedestal. She's towering above a fleeing mob of workers, many who are carrying pistols in a public space that's like the Haymarket. She's preparing to throw a bomb inscribed law into the mob. In the background stands the statue of a policeman, his pistol drawn, whose death Miss Liberty is preparing to avenge through mass destruction of these crazy alien workers. So that's, an, uh, he's espousing state terrorism, um, maybe even genocide. He's taken every image of the um, anarchists and reversed them. And now liberty means destruction. And this is one of the most powerful cartoons Nast ever drew. And if I have anything to say about it, it will be on the cover of my book. Also from Harper's Weekly. Clearly the Statue of Liberty, it's too immense, Liberty is, uh, to appear in one frame. The cartoon is called Liberty is Not Anarchy. This is September 4th, 1886. Here, Miss Liberty, so huge only her hands and part of her cloak appear in the frame of the drawing. The statue-sized heroine grasps the Chicago anarchist leaders between the fingers of her hand. She's ready to squash them like beetles. While with the other hand, she holds a huge sword marked U.S., and the ring on her finger says Union. The hilt of the sword makes a mighty cross with the blade. Here's Christianity united with republicanism to avenge liberty through destruction. Railroaded by the state, their comrades beaten and shot down on the streets. So that's, that's reactionary violence, mirroring, responding to, combating revolutionary violence. The difference is the state has a lot more guns and a lot more power. Railroaded by the state, their comrades beaten and shot down on the streets. The anarchists uh, in the docket reversed the claim as to who was savage and who was civilized. The men in trial insisted, knowing that they're going to be hanged, by the way, they insisted that they were the repository of eternal humanistic ideals, expressed their protests against a system that was devouring workers and preparing to slaughter the workers' anarchist servants after a kangaroo trial. Albert Parsons wrote to his wife after proclaiming his unspeakable love for her and her children and their children, for the people, humanity, I cry out and again and again in the doomed victim cell, liberty, justice, equality. Facing execution for their faith, the anarchists embraced the notion of martyrdom, a Christian notion. 
The more the state reviled them, the more the crowd masses, the cowed masses howled, the more certain were anarchists that their deaths would contain deep meaning. The stupid mass imagined that we anarchists must be something very bad, and they joined in the chorus with their enemies and fleecers, crucify, crucify. Though a proud atheist, with such languish, August Spies, one of the convicted, reached towards identification with the murder of Jesus Christ to demonstrate both his pain and his eternal commitment. Another Chicago anarchist added, the blood of martyrs is the seed of the church. Surely end times were fast approaching. Surely the anarchist martyrdom signaled the imminent arrival of the, the millennium. As Albert Parsons put it, this is the seed time, the harvest time is near. We are the sowers now, but we will reap very soon. With, a, with, with apocalyptic and melodramatic and histrionic faith, Parsons insisted it must be liberty for the people or death for the capitalists. I love humanity and therefore die for it. No one could do more. Every drop of my blood shall count as an avenger. And woe to America when these are in arms. At the same time, he rejected organized religion as a tool of the Pharisees. He could not believe there was a supreme being who would allow men to use war and establish false states. He said, there's but one God, humanity. Any other kind of religion is a mockery, a delusion, and a snare. And yet he imagined that he was Jesus of the before the Pharisees. And he believed that according to the higher law of nature, service to humanity was service to an alternative supreme being. He knew that his death for his soon to triumph ideals would have permanent meaning. Others said, oh, call your hangman, truth crucified in Socrates, in Christ, in, Giard in Giardino Bruni, in Huss, in Galileo still loves. We are ready to follow. Now there was some um, protest about these trials. And in fact, the certain of the, of the um, three of them had their, their sentences commuted to life imprisonment. Uh, but, but as I said, five were condemned uh, to death, four were hanged. Uh, and one uh, killed himself before he could be hanged. Uh, and then this actually had the impact of discrediting the labor movement um, for a long time. It was one of the things that was used against the labor movement. You see this means revolution, and this is what it really is. So it was, in fact, used by the estate quite effectively uh, as a means, an ideological means, to hammer all working men. It was a way of reasserting domination on the part of the state. Um, quite often in American history, and at very crucial moments, the most punishing form of law and order has expressed the prevailing view of how liberty needs to be protected and enhanced. Christian and Republican values, when embattled, can easily be reoriented to justify violent punishment of dissidents in the name of justice, liberty, truth, and order. Fear can be the path down which freedom is proclaimed. And as well as killing the odd anarchist, the effect of cowing the public is uh, not inconsiderable. Um, the Chicago anarchists and the Chicago authorities, in fact, did not talk past one another. They conducted a struggle for the hearts and minds of all citizens. And however you look at it, terrorism won. Thank you. Questions? Comments? Yes? I, I'm just thinking about um, what makes an anarchist, and I wonder whether there's a uh, nucleus group of, of people who um, are unbalanced, um, who have you know, all kinds of reasons to not see the world um, as a place to make good. Um, Um, let's, let me see if I can rephrase this. Tell me, because they couldn't hear you. So tell me if I get this right, okay? She's saying, <clears throat> is there a kind of a pathology for anarchism? Uh, people who are quite unbalanced um, and who pray, as it were, or appeal to um, large numbers of people whose lives 
are very, very difficult. Um, well, most of us have natural boundaries to what we're willing to do when we're angry or, or when we're, we feel that, that people are oppressed. I don't know how many of you have ever lived in a situation like it would have been to be an unemployed Chicago worker from Germany in the, in the, in the winter of 1886 and the, the subsequent spring. It was pretty miserable. And to know that the police would come and, well, they were beating a lot of people up and killing people. They were breaking strikes, sending in scabs. Uh, people were hungry. Uh, they were desperate. And in those circumstances, the anarchists give them an ideology uh, around which to frame their discontent. Um, and basically it's saying it's also acceptable, just blow the goddamn thing up. Now we probably can understand that impulse, but we never act on it, or hope we don't. Um, whether it should be considered the language of pathology, I'm not so sure. And what's interesting to me is the language that the state uses, the language that the preachers use, and the press, I haven't even read you from the press, is, is, it, is it equally blood-curdling. It's really... You heard some of it, kill the bastards, and it, it's also the language of extremism. Um, and so there's this, to my mind, this interchange of very violent language and violent deeds. Now, nobody knows who threw that bomb. It could have been an agent provocateur. Uh, they never caught the person. And the people, I've left a lot out, as you might imagine in this story, the people who are hanged are told, they, the uh, the judge and the state's attorney tell the, the jurors, look, we don't have proof. They tried these cockamamie proofs that these guys actually did the bombing, but the defense attorney could show that none of them were actually at the square. They were more, mainly in, in taverns. Uh, and um, uh, one guy who was a petty criminal from Cedar Rapids, Iowa, who got thrown in jail, testified that he heard Field and, no, no, Schwab and Anyway, two of the German Spies and Schwab out in the, in the um, alley, he saw them uh, get the bomb together to prepare to hand to somebody, and he heard what they were saying, which is, we're going to bomb them. Well, those two men would have spoken only German to one another. So all that kind of direct evidence collapsed in the courtroom. They had a good attorney, actually, a guy named Black, whose friends all disowned him. Um, and uh, so what the, what the uh, judge said is, look, if these people used language that inspired these acts, I shouldn't have left this out of this discussion. If they inspired these acts by their words, it doesn't matter who did the actual bombing, they're conspirators, okay? And you should um, sentence them to death. Well, in other words, they're being, they're, the, the conspiracy is anarchist ideas. And there were actually a few people who protested this, uh, who as a simple attack on, on, on dissent. So they were actually convicted for their ideas. It was really clear. It really was a form of judicial murder. The, the jury was stacked. Everything was stacked against these guys. And by this definition, if these guys said, look, things are terrible. Somebody ought to throw, somebody ought to take up and make dynamite and use it. And then somebody throws a bomb. Therefore, the people who said those things are guilty of the crime as part of a criminal conspiracy. Well, in times of extreme public fear, this is a very fearsome event. It's as, this was at least as big as 9-11, by the way. Uh, under those circumstances, when the public authorities whip up fear, when they go to kill people, they can do it with uh, a trial, and they can do it with um, um, a, a, a process, and they can hang them uh, in, in, inside a jail. They've got all that kind of power on their side. And they can use this kind of event to drum up opposition to these anarchists and to say anybody who has those kind of attitudes about labor, such people are all anarchists, really. These are un-American people. They're the off-scourings of Europe, so it's used to discredit them. Now, what I'm trying to do very hard in this book is not, uh, is to be detached on the issue of, of morality, because I think there's plenty of attacks on morality to go around. I don't think it's just evil anarchists or evil a terrorist out there and the state being good. I think there's plenty of evil acting going around. And I think when people like George Bush talk about the evil doers, they're talking about devils. And in fact, when he let slip that it was Islam that was the problem, remember that early on? Uh, he's making this kind of argument out of the ideology 
of Islam comes this sort of thing. He calls it, people around him call it Islamofascism. And then they set up a whole state apparatus, including uh, 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 concentration camps. Uh, and we don't know how many people have been killed uh, in, by death squads. It happened. Uh, Jane Meyer talks about it. So the state is much better organized when it comes to that, and they can use this. So I'm not, I'm not making a brief for the anarchists. I'm not saying these are nice guys. Uh, and I, what I find interesting, however, is first of all, they're human beings, and they are trying to speak up for the downtrodden, for whom there's very little social justice in that world. They're trying. Uh, they're uh, so angry they, they, and, and so in love with violence that they, they kind of delude themselves. I would put it that way, that this will work. But, um, okay. Yeah. There's, it's got to be a special profile. You can't. I can't imagine that a normal thinking person can be converted into someone who is willing to, to destroy. Them. Did you hear her? She's she's still arguing from abnormality. I actually think what's interesting is how ordinary uh, this kind of political violence can be. It's under the right circumstances. This is not that hard to convince people to do it. If you look at the history of Bosnia, for example, people have been neighbors and friends for generations and intermarried. Same language, basically. They look the same. One bunch was Muslim and the other bunch was Christian. And within 24, 48 hours, they're killing each other, raping each other, and all that sort of thing. I think, actually, that people can be re-educated quite quickly to do the most violent acts. I don't overrate our species. I think we're quite capable of these things. We're really lucky living in Canada, aren't we? None of these things are on top of us. We haven't been there. Um, but I've yeah, talked, we well, not, well, like the well, yes, OK, sure. Terrible as terrible. Yes, that's correct. I mean, historically, I mean, personally, I'm, what I'm saying is I'm hoping none of us personally have lived through this. Of course, the Louis Riel business, the Winnipeg general strike, there have been lots of, of violence. Actually, what was done to the Indians in the 18th century in Canada was quite something to behold. And it had much of the same quality as this. So we're not above it. What I'm saying is that if we're really lucky, we don't have to experience it personally. But it's not something that crazy people alone do. People can be driven to choose quite free, under the right circumstances. It's not that hard to convince people to rework themselves. We have this peacetime persona, right? I am somebody. I've got a personality. She's got a personality, and he's got a personality. What happens, though, if there's extreme pressure and duress? All bets can be off. I'll give you a, a homey example. How many of you have been through a divorce? Do you think that brought out the best in you? <laughs> God bless you. I have been there, and I don't think it was grace under pressure. Uh, I didn't kill anybody, and I remember thinking, thank God they're lawyers or else homicide might be an alternative. But what I'm saying is sometimes in our lives, we've behaved badly. We know we have. We've done terrible things, unless you haven't lived, which is also possible. Okay, well, then you get a little measure, just a little sense of yourself. Have any of you guys been at war? Been in combat? Well, I've talked to many men who've been in combat. I've written about war for years. And what they'll tell me when we talk quietly among ourselves, and they understand I'm this scholar who's not being um, sensationalistic, what they'll tell me about what happens during combat, you actually wouldn't believe if you've not been in combat. And they, as much as they can, they say that was over there and this is over here. That's if they're healthy. The unhealthy ones are the ones who can't ever get away from over there. I've talked to some of them too. So I think our personalities are quite malleable, actually. So I disagree with you. I think we are quite malleable that normal people can do terrible things. And remember, these are terrible times. And the state is acting in a very oppressive way. This, there's no uh, reform tradition in 1886 in Chicago. Authorities, the police, that's about it. They don't have social welfare institutions. The churches did a little bit of giving food away or shelter, but not much. So these people are genuinely desperate. And in that situation, the idea of doing something, of taking vengeance, of being powerful instead of powerless, has its attractions. 
I try to say, look, this is the most despised person in the world, the terrorist. Uh, I'm not making a case for him, but I want us to understand him. And the best way you can understand people is to take a little piece of yourself, and that's what historians are supposed to do, and time travel by imagination. Think yourself into that person's position. Instead of saying, he's evil, he's the antichrist, he's the evil doer, destroy him. That's a pretty way, easy way to deal with this stuff. And if you're running a United States Army, you've got the means to do something that way. More questions? Yes, sir. Isn't there a difference between a revolutionary and a terrorist? Because to my mind, what these people are doing there, they were not terrorists, they were revolutionaries. A terrorist is somebody from outside the state that's trying to destroy the state. That's the usual definition of terrorism, that the terrorist is somebody outside the state who's trying to destroy it. What I'm trying to do is, in fact, Remember my quote from Martha Crenshaw? How do we separate terrorists from war criminals? How do we separate terrorists from what states do? States do terror. The Argentinian state disappeared 30,000 people from 1986 to 93, I think it was. No, 79 to 86, something like that. I've got it in my introduction. 30,000 people, they disappeared. You know what they, how they disappear? They put them in an airplane, go up to 30,000 feet, go over the ocean, and dump them out. Now, that's state terrorism. Uh, and sometimes states initiate terrorism. I have one example of uh, paramilitary forces in the American South, white men, destroying Reconstruction by very well-organized terrorism. So they seize state power through a kind of pooch that was done through terrorism. During wars, what happens in guerrilla warfare, what happens in colonial wars, when armies are fighting against um, civilians in ways that they know are illegal. I believe that that's war crime. I also believe it's terrorism. And even George Bush talks about the war on terror. All these things meld together. It's comforting to think that terrorism is merely the act of individuals or non-state groups against the state and stop there. But once you start saying, what about state terrorism? Then you start asking a whole bunch of other questions. That's what my book's about. And I'm going to get terrible reviews. I'm going to get trashed because I'm not using the conventional definition of terrorism. I'm up for it because I think it's time to rethink what we mean by terrorism. Terrorism is a common mode of domination. Political violence and the threat of political violence. What about when the Bush regime is as fear-driven as it is, and then they say, what does the Attorney General say in the United States? Whatever the executive branch needs to do if it apprehends terrorism is legal. That's what Gonzalez said. That means the state has been licensed to do anything. Concentration camps, using special military units to disappear people. They're called ghosts. Read Jane Meyer's book. She's not an alarmist type at all. She's kind of a boring journalist. Um, um, throwing people in prisons with no right to an attorney, no charges, no speedy hearing, no civil liberties. Okay? And we don't know what all. Okay? There are evidently a half a dozen prisons in places like Uzbekistan, which are set up by the Americans to put people. This, is, this will come out in the next 10 or 20 years. Okay, now... All that, to my mind, I regard that as terrorism. And it's also produced a really fearful impact on the American public, who don't want to ask questions about what their state's doing, because their state is defending freedom and liberty and truth. So I'm talking about those arguments, those values, and I'm trying to be detached about it. I'm not making a case for one side or the other, although, as I say, the state has more power and therefore is more dangerous to all of us in the long run. <coughs> so that's my thesis. And I hope you buy the book when it comes out. And I know, don't worry about it, it's going to get a lot of nasty reviews. But I think it's time that these things be said. Uh, and I think the conventional way of dealing with terrorism is just too convenient morally. Well, I'll get mixed. The people in the, in the, in the counter-terrorism business, I know they hate it. Because um, I've already seen some of the readers they got, readers reports for Yale University Press. You can't do that. We know what terrorism, it's this. It's not that too. 
And I had to argue with my editors. And I said, no, wait a minute. Uh, that demonstrates that I'm challenging the conventional definition. So I do think that this needs some rethinking and some demystifying. And I think we have to be especially critical of what our states do. Now, I have to say a word for Canada. Canadians, I think, more than Americans, believe that their state is benign. And I don't know what our soldiers are doing in Afghanistan, for example. Maybe they're better than every other army. Maybe they're not attacking civilians. Maybe they're not shooting first and making up the law afterwards. Maybe they're not. Maybe they really are better than all other colonial soldiers. Do you think that's possible? Because we're Canadians and we know we're good? And we don't know. We don't want to know what goes on in prisons. We don't want to know about it. Uh, we don't want to know what the police do. We don't ask too many questions. When we start hearing about the taser guns, we start thinking, wait a minute. So every day, domination it uses methods that we really don't want to know about. We say, oh, well, you know, it's, a, it's applied to the trash, to those kind of criminal elements, to crazy people. And not to people like you and me. So I don't, I don't mean to be too outrageous. It's just the Canadians have this, our, our disease is smugness. And uh, I have talked to Canadian veterans of World War II. And the conversations I've had with them have been pretty similar to those I've had with American veterans of that war and other wars. Uh, and if they, they, mostly veterans won't talk to you about combat. They don't want to talk about it. There's a good reason, because they don't want to relive it. Um, when I was writing an earlier book, I, I had to talk to some com people in combat. I was writing about guerrilla warfare in Missouri during the American Civil War, which also shows up in this book. And these guys were, were shooting down each other like crazy. They never took prisoners, or rarely took prisoners. And they would mutilate each other's bodies, and probably torture them before death, too. And so I talked to. Remember, I was at Princeton for a year, and I talked to a political scientist who had been in Korea as a Marine lieutenant, and another guy who had been in the Second World War as a, as a corporal in Germany. And I talked to them about these things. And I'll never forget the guy, the political scientist. He took me out to lunch at the edge of town. He was a friend of my dad's, actually. And we went out to the edge of town, and I asked him, I read this. How do I make sense of this? Because it was very hard to write about such things. And I'd talk about that, and he literally would go like this, and he'd draw out a memory of his men doing exactly the same thing. And then I'd, it was awful. And then I'd say, oh, I'm so sorry, Walter. He understood that he was my native informant, right? He understood I wasn't asking gratuitously, and he, these are memories that were coming out 30 years later. And he, he hadn't talked about it very much, but he understood why I was asking. And his men did all the things I found in my book. And he said <clears throat> that he thought about stopping them, but that somehow there was something cathartic. It, yeah, I know, it's terrible. And the whole point of combat, it's so unlike the rest of life, you can't even imagine it. And then he also shared a story with me, the handsomest guy in his company, they were up on a hilltop and the Chinese were charging, was this black fellow from um, Ohio, beautiful young man. And at one point, a Chinese soldier came up and was just about to shoot Walter. And the, this corporal did what you're supposed to do, which is save your officer. Right? He threw his body across Walters and took the bullet. And Walter said, I've lived with that the rest of my life. OK, we live steady state lives, most of us, most of the time. But this is a whole other terrain. And the easiest way to deal with it is to say, those are evil people. Rid ourselves of those evil people. I'm not saying they're not evil. I'm saying they're not the only ones who are evil. And I don't think it's so easy as good versus evil. We want to believe that. Do we believe that? But this young man who threw himself to save That's a different kind of story. No, but the point is, he could, he, if he hadn't done it, the guy would have died. And he wouldn't, he wouldn't have, nobody would have known, right? Yes. So, what, so under that horrible circumstance, yeah. Brave thing. And you hear about men falling on grenades to save their brothers. There's a kind of intensity of love between soldiers in combat. 
At the same time, there's this weird indifference and joking about it. It's all just too bizarre. It's another whole terrain. It's what we can do, though. We can reorganize our mentalities and our values and do all kinds of terrible things. But what I'm trying to say in this book is, look, we have this corpus of shared values. And in the United States, it's, it's Christianity and liberty, the libertarian tradition, right? Those are the basic civil values. And it's very interesting the way those can be used in this kind of terrorist framework. Like Miss Liberty throwing a bomb into a crowd and the bomb is marked Liberty. I mean, that, that, these cartoons are so powerful. I mean, I, I couldn't believe that one. So it's, um, it's uh, a form of mortal combat. It's also shared ideas. And it's, yes, it is one form of, of revolutionary terrorism and another form of reactionary terrorism. That is the political purposes of that terrorism. One set's revolutionary, the other set is reactionary. And uh, so I think there is political purpose. I don't think you can say terrorism on the one hand, revolutionism on the other. And if you want a really blood-curdling read, read Trotsky's uh, pamphlet called Red Terror that he wrote in 1918 or 19. When they do it, it's immoral and evil. When we do it, it is just because we're right and they're wrong. And God is on our side. And, yeah, well, God, he didn't believe in God. She says, and God is on our side. The revolution, capital T, capital R, is God. It's the equivalent of God. It's the apocalypse. You see what I was doing with that imagery as I'm saying this revolutionary anarchist imagery that's so actually atheist is in its own way a replication of Christian belief. And that belief in the revolution, it's the belief in end times that are fast approaching. It is the apocalypse. It's an interesting inversion of those values. And then Miss Liberty with the bomb, that's a reinversion. So liberty means revenge. Uh, these, these language contests are very important. They have a lot to do with how we frame who we are and how we are as citizens and what we think our state is. Yes. You guys are being great. This is all an argument, you know. It's not the truth. Yeah. Uh, in your opinion, I'm not sure uh, uh, if, uh, if you have, uh, I'm not quite sure in my mind yes. about your opinion. Yeah. Yeah. Is it ever justified, in your opinion? Is terrorism, torture, Guantanamo Bay, let's say, is that justified in a society that's claiming to speak for liberty and, and justice for all? Is that a fair rephrasing? Is it ever justified? Is it ever justified? Um, it's done all the time, as if it were justified. I'm not a power holder, so I'm the wrong guy to ask. But it's, it's done all the time. It's easy enough to say, I'm killing you because you're a threat to liberty, and I'm serving liberty. <laughs> it's not that hard to do. Now, the argument about torture is a real problem because torture doesn't work. Okay, so it, it, the idea that that's how you get stuff out of people, it isn't true. When you use those instruments, when you take the walk on the dark side, that's a quote from Dick Cheney who will soon be the ex-vice president. When you take a walk on that dark side, what is this freedom you're talking about? What is liberty? What is fair play? What is the law? If you're above the law, you can say, I will do anything to defend the principle of the law, though what I am doing I know to be illegal. And you know how we make ourselves do that? We get the attorney general to say, anything you do is legal. Well, come on, that's moral kindergarten. That's not the law. Now you can say, one conclusion you can draw from my line of work is states will do whatever they need to do to survive in their minds. They'll take whatever actions they want. And the idea of freedom of speech is a fiction. There's only freedom of speech if the state allows you to have freedom of speech. And when they want to curtail it, they will. And there's something else even more insidious. People, when they get frightened, are afraid to dissent. 
They're afraid to say, that's what you're doing and it's wrong. They're afraid to stand up. And fear-inducing behaviors on the part of governments, it's part of the point, right? If we do those things to them, and rumors of it bleed through, fewer people are going to want to do that in the future. The idea of Guantanamo Bay, in part, it's supposed to be a prophylactic against future terrorist actions, which is, of course, complete nonsense. They're going to operate out of their own universal values no matter what you do. And you're not going to curtail them by torturing them. I don't believe any of that apparatus works. You can use normal police powers to ferret out what people are doing. I don't think you need... Well, remember Trudeau and the War Measures Act? You know how many people were in those two terrorist cells? I believe three in one and four in the other, wasn't it? It was nasty what they did. They called out, remember the, the, the uh, tanks rolling down the street in Montreal? And 486 people being thrown in prison just because somebody suspected them? Turned out a lot of them were political enemies of Trudeau from way back, especially in the labor movement. And I actually wanted to talk to a labor guy from... Quebec, who had been one of those 486, he said, I was so honored. Of course, I hadn't done anything, but I was... De well, they used... Actually, what, what Trudeau did wouldn't have been legal in the United States. It was martial law. It was the War Measures Act. He used the troops uh, and tanks to round up 500 people and throw them in the slammer without charges, without lawyers, nothing. On the grounds that these six people in these terrorist cells were creating an insurrection. Now, the later stories are that he was pushed to do that by, the, uh, by Bourassa. Was it Bourassa in Quebec? That they were terrified and they, they, they'd lost their moorings. And that's what he did. Remember, he's asked, what, what else are you going to do? He says, what did he say? Watch me. Isn't that meant to induce fear? I think so. Remember the crazy mayor out here, the drunkard? There was another guy named Campbell who wanted to arrest all the hippies off the beaches and throw them in the slammer. And they got a phone call from um, uh, Ottawa and said, no, 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 that's not what we mean. I had been in Canada about a year when that came up. And when I came up from the States, I wasn't a political, uh, I wasn't a refugee from the American Armed Forces. In fact, I was 26 and had a baby. They weren't going to get me. Oh, it's so free up here. I can breathe. It was wonderful. A year later, Trudeau reminded me of what it is that states will do when, people, when states feel threatened. Now, that's a small thing in comparison to Guantanamo, but it was bad enough at the time, and I think it had a pernicious effect for quite a long time, and it was definitely meant to induce fear in, in the populace. Well, look what happened to whistleblowers. Yeah. You know what bothers me even more is so many people I know who see something that's really disturbing, and they won't stand up and be counted, they won't protest, because they're afraid that maybe somebody will get them if they say. So they're, they're silent, silence out of fear. That's how it works. Or people are afraid to write books with unpopular opinions because somebody might not like it. The don't want to know theory yes. to the Canadian how, area. How, how well, you have something in mind that I don't quite understand. Right. Yeah. Yes. It was curious. Um, they didn't round up the, uh, leader, the Sikh leadership in Canada. They were pretty sure they knew who had inspired it. I don't think they knew who did it. Uh, it was very bad police work, as far as I can tell. They didn't round up a bunch of people and throw them in prison and beat them up until they got at it. Did they? I don't think so. Um, OK. I, if I take your point, it's that the state doesn't choose to respond to every action the same way. That's true. And sometimes you wonder if there isn't, you know, why they respond more in some cases than in others. I dare say that 9-11 was very big. And 
the Haymarket was not a small event. Um, uh, I also have a chapter on John Brown, his raid on Harper's Ferry. He was a terrorist. It's actually quite similar in structure to the story I've just told you. And um, um, that was an absolutely cataclysmic public event. In fact, it's one of the causes of the Civil War um, is John Brown's raid because terrified the Southerners. The state of Virginia hanged him as you wouldn't believe how fast that trial was. He wasn't even over his wound yet. Um, so these incidents happen in history. And I think there's a pattern, a template to learn from it. Because you're likely to discover that states are likely to do similar things in the future from what they've done in the past. And this whole ideological configuration I'm describing is used and reused and reused and reused until the present. So listen, friends, I think that, that we've run through our time. I want, it's amazing you'd come here on a Saturday afternoon uh, to listen to such a talk, and I, I very much appreciate your, your coming. Thank you.